Hello, welcome back to We Love Reading with Miss Summer. We're going to continue with reading A Bear Called Paddington by Michael Bond. If you remember last time, we were right in the middle of chapter one. So we'll pick up where we left off. The buffet was crowded when they entered, but Mr. Brown managed to find a table for two in a corner by standing on a chair, Paddington could just rest his paws comfortably on the glass top. He looked around with interest while Mr Brown went to fetch the tea. The sight of everyone eating reminded him of how hungry he felt. There was a half-eaten bun on the table, but just as he reached out his paw, a waitress came up and swept it into a pan. You don't want that, dearie, she said giving him a friendly pat. You don't know where it's been. Paddington felt so empty, he didn't really mind where it had been, but he was much too polite to say anything. Well, Paddington, said Mr Brown, as he placed two steaming cups of tea on the table and a plate piled high with cakes. How's that to be going on with? Paddington's eyes glistened. It's very nice, thank you, he exclaimed eyeing the tea doubtfully. But it's rather hard drinking out of a cup. I usually get my head stuck or else my hat falls in and it makes it taste nasty. Mr Brown hesitated. Hmm, then you'd better give your hat to me. I'll pour the tea into a saucer for you. It's not really done in the best circles, but I'm sure no one will mind just this once. Paddington removed his hat and laid it carefully on the table while Mr Brown poured out the tea. He looked hungrily at the cakes, in particular at a large cream and jam one which Mr Brown had placed in the plate in front of him. There you are, Paddington, he said. I'm sorry they haven't any marmalade ones, but they were the best I could get. Oh, I'm glad I emigrated, said Paddington as he reached out a paw and pulled the plate nearer. Do you think anyone would mind if I stood on the table to eat? Before Mr Brown could answer, he had climbed up and placed his right paw firmly on the bun. It was a very large bun, the biggest and stickiest Mr Brown had been able to find, and in a matter of moments, most of the inside found its way onto Paddington's whiskers. People started to nudge each other and began staring in their direction. Mr Brown wished he had chosen a plain, ordinary bun. But he wasn't very experienced in the ways of bears. He stirred his tea and looked out of the window, pretending he had tea with a bear on Paddington Station every day of his life. Henry! The sound of his wife's voice brought him back to earth with a start. Henry! Whatever are you doing to that poor bear? Look at him. He's covered all over with cream and jam. Mr Brown jumped up in confusion. You seemed rather hungry, he answered lamely. Mrs Brown turned to her daughter. This is what happens when I leave your father alone for five minutes. Judy clapped her hands excitedly. Oh! If he does, said Mrs Brown, I can see someone other than your father will have to look after him. Just look at the mess he's in. Paddington, who all this time had been too interested in his bun to worry about what was going on, suddenly became aware that people were talking about him. He looked up to see that Mrs Brown had been joined by a little girl with laughing blue eyes and long fair hair. He jumped up meaning to raise his hat, and in his haste slipped on a patch of strawberry jam, which somehow or other had found its way onto the glass tabletop. For a brief moment he had a dizzy impression of everything and everyone being upside down. He waved his paws wildly in the air, and then, before anyone could catch him, he somersaulted backwards and landed with a splash in his saucer of tea. 
He jumped up even quicker than he had sat down because the tea was still very hot and promptly stepped into Mr Brown's cup. Judy threw back her head and laughed until the tears rolled down her face. Oh, Mummy, isn't he funny? she cried. Paddington, who didn't think it at all funny, stood for a moment with one foot on the table and the other in Mr Brown's tea. There were large patches of white cream all over his face and on his left ear there was a lump of strawberry jam. You wouldn't think, said Mrs Brown, that anyone could get in such a state with just one bun. Mr Brown coughed. He had just caught the stern eye of a waitress on the other side of the counter. Perhaps, he said, we'd better go. I'll see if I can find a taxi. He picked up Judy's belongings and hurried outside. Paddington stepped gingerly off the table and with a last look at the sticky remains of his bun, climbed down onto the floor. Judy took one of his paws. Come along, Paddington. We'll take you home and you can have a nice hot bath. Then you can tell me all about South America. I'm sure you must have had lots of wonderful adventures. I have, said Paddington earnestly. Lots. Things are always happening to me. I'm that sort of a bear. When they came out of the buffet, Mr Brown had already found a taxi and he waved them across. The driver looked hard at Paddington and then at the inside of his nice, clean taxi. Burrs is extra, he said gruffly. Sticky bears is twice as much again. He can't help being sticky driver, said Mr Brown. He's just had a nasty accident. The driver hesitated. All right, up him. But mine, none of it comes off him on me interior. I only cleaned it out this morning. The Browns trooped obediently into the back of the taxi. Mr and Mrs Brown and Judy sat in the back. While Paddington stood on a tip-up seat behind the driver so that he could see out of the window. The sun was shining as they drove out of the station. After the gloom and the noise, everything seemed bright and cheerful. They swept past a group of people at a bus stop and Paddington waved. Several people stared and one man raised his hat in return. It was all very friendly. After weeks of sitting alone in a lifeboat, there was so much to see. There were people and cars and big red buses everywhere. It wasn't a bit like darkest Peru. Paddington kept one eye out of the window in case he missed anything. With his other eye, he carefully examined Mr and Mrs Brown and Judy. Mr Brown was fat and jolly, with a big moustache and glasses, while Mrs Brown, who was also rather plump, looked like a larger edition of Judy. Paddington had just decided he was going to like staying with the Browns, when the glass window behind the driver shot back and a gruff voice said, Where did you say you wanted to go? Mr Brown leaned forward. Number 32 Windsor Gardens. The driver cupped his ear with one hand. Can't hear you, he shouted. Paddington tapped him on the shoulder. Number 32 Windsor Gardens, he repeated. The taxi driver jumped at the sound of Paddington's voice and narrowly missed hitting a bus. He looked down at his shoulder and glared. Cream, he said bitterly. All over me, no coat! Judy giggled and Mr and Mrs Brown exchanged glances. Mr Brown peered at the meter. He half expected to see a sign go up saying that he had to pay another 50 pence. I beg your pardon said Paddington. He bent forward and tried to rub the stain off with his other paw. Several bun crumbs and a smear of jam added themselves mysteriously to the taxi driver's coat. The driver gave Paddington a long, hard look. Paddington raised his hat 
and the driver slammed the window shut again. Oh dear, said Mrs Brown, we really shall have to give him a bath as soon as we get indoors, it's getting everywhere. Paddington looked thoughtfully. It wasn't so much that he didn't like baths, he really didn't mind being covered with jam and cream. It seemed a pity to wash it all off quite so soon. But before he had time to consider the matter, the taxi stopped and the Browns began to climb out. Paddington picked up his suitcase and followed Judy up a flight of white steps to a big green door. Now, you're going to meet Mrs Bird, said Judy. She looks after us. She's a bit fierce sometimes and she grumbles a lot, but she doesn't really mean it. I'm sure you'll like her. Paddington felt his knees began to tremble. He looked round for Mr and Mrs Brown, but they appeared to be having some sort of argument with the taxi driver. Behind the door he could hear footsteps approaching. I'm sure I shall like her if you say so, he said, catching sight of his reflection on the brightly polished letterbox. But will she like me? That's the end of chapter one. Tune in again next time for chapter two.